Thank you. Good evening. So, so before I get started, and I'll keep this short <clears throat> because Andrew told me I I absolutely had to be done by eight thirty. Um, okay, I'm I'm kidding. I twenty five minutes tops. Um, how many of you have ever been overseas or in a church where they primarily spoke another language besides English? Wow, awesome. Have you have you been in that environment? and listen to them pray. You can't understand a single word they're saying, but there's a connection, right? Because they're talking to God. Um, I ask that because as Andrew was talking about the, the night of prayer, um, there is something powerful about being in a room full of people, whether you can understand them or not, um, and, and praying together. It can be really uncomfortable, <laughs> it can be really awkward, but it's it's worth the time. My first experience with a, a night of prayer was at Bible College. I went to Moody Bridal, I mean to Moody Bible Institute, and um, they had yeah, given up. They had what they called a concert of prayer, so it was all night. It started at like eight o'clock and it ended at like six o'clock, and you spent most of the night in groups of people that you saw but didn't really know very well kneeling on a concrete floor with carpet that may as well not be there scrunched in between wooden chairs you know like the old theater chairs um so um that was that was a really powerful thing so so in bible school uh, people are a little bit different than in like the normal world um <clears throat> and and you can become slightly irre irreverent so I've got kind of a, f a funny story about that first concert of prayer, and and if I get in trouble for telling you this, it's been really nice being a youth leader. And um, <clears throat> no, so so I had a I had a group of friends, and we formed this fake band, and we called it Howard and the Whaleys, because one of the senior vice presidents of the illustrious Moody Bible Institute was a gentleman, a very godly gentleman by the name of Howard Whaley. Howard was about this tall, three weeks older, or younger than the earth, had this huge, like, wine-colored birthmark over half of his face. And when you got into chapel and Howard Whaley got up to pray, you groaned because he prayed for, like, hours. And he just had this monotone, you know. So, so we would... We would sit around our boombox with the microphone plugged in because that's what you did back then. And we would hold press releases uh, for, for this band, Howard and the Whaleys. And of course, as you may imagine, we, we mocked Mr. Whaley, um, Dr. Whaley, mercilessly. I mean, we would sell like Howard Whaley's greatest hits. And, and one of the guys would be in the background just droning, you know, monotone, the Lord's Prayer and whatever. And it was like those late night infomercials. I don't know if you've ever seen them where, you know, like the, the, the greatest hits of the 70s and, you know, disco's greatest hits and stuff like that. So, so we had Howard Whaley's greatest hits. It was a lot of fun. So I went, I went to this concert of prayer. We prayed all night. It was very spiritual. And then we had breakfast the next morning. And Walking up to the table with my fellow bandmates was none other than Dr. Howard Whaley. And he sat down, and we could hardly look him in the eye because we'd been mocking him for the last, you know, six months. Turns out he's the coolest guy ever. Wanted to be a, a Navy pilot in World War II. He couldn't be an officer because of his birthmark. Um, went into full-time ministry, and so, of course, we felt horrible. Um, for a little while, and then we continued with our press releases and just <laughs> prayed that, that he never never got wind of them. So, anyway, um, that aside, we're going to talk about community <clears throat> tonight. Uh, what is community? Why is it a big deal? Why do we need it? What is biblical community? Things along those lines. So, let's start off with prayer, if we could. Um, I like how Andrew does it, so let's pray for three things. Um, pray for yourself, that God would speak to you tonight. Pray for somebody you know that's hurting, and given the announcement earlier, um, there are certainly plenty of those. And then pray for me, um, 
that I would take the living word of God and not kill it, um, that I would, I would be able to speak clearly, and that uh, you would hear from the Lord tonight. So um, I'll give you a little while, and then I'll, uh, I'll close in prayer, and we'll get started. Lord, I would come to you tonight and just thank you for each of the students that are here, for each of the leaders that are here to spend time not only enjoying fellowship together, but uh, worshiping you and discussing things of importance, things from your word. So I ask, Lord, uh, that you would be with those, that you would be with the family of this student, and that you would be with his uh, friends and classmates. Just bring comfort, Father, we ask. Um, pray for opportunities to share Christ. Um, and I ask above all things that you would be glorified. I ask that we would hear from you through your word, that we would be able to see a glimpse of who you are and your glory. And um, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so community. How many of you could not wait for tonight to talk about community because that's like just the greatest thing ever? Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, so it was all the leaders that raised their hand. Thank you. Um, so so what, what is community? Why are we even talking about that? Why is it one of our core values at Sailorville? So this is like where you guys answer back. What is community? Just shout something out. God's people. Thank you. I'll pay you later. <clears throat> Anyone else? Community. What do you think? What is community? Togetherness. Togetherness. Okay. All right. A group. Fellowship. Fellowship. All, all good things. So I, I did what, you know, any good teacher would do, and I looked it up in the dictionary. So here's what Merriam-Webster's dictionary says a community is. It's a group of people with common characteristic or interests living together within a larger society. Gripping stuff, yeah. Um, in the Bible, fellowship, um, as Winston just said, is often used interchangeably with the idea of Christian community. The definition of fellowship is a community of interest, activity, feeling, purpose, or experience. Being associated a company of equals or friends, that sort of thing. So how many of you have seen the Lord of the Rings trilogy? All right. Now you're starting to track with me? Fellowship of the Ring. Why is it called that? Because there's a group of men and dwarves and hobbits that are all united for the common purpose of taking the one ring to the Mount Doom in Mordor and throwing it in and therefore by destroying it and ending the reign and the threat of Sauron. Um, so why is community important? Just throw out, throw out a guess. Why? So that's great. It's, it's a group of people. You've got something in common. You've got a common purpose. You've got a common interest. Um, sports fans. That's a community. I mean, how many, how many Chiefs fans are there in here? Okay, not too many. How many, how many, oh, how many Cardinals fans are there? Okay, I'm just gonna have to leave now. Um, <clears throat> um, and now I've got stage fright. I can't think of it. But I mean, you get you get some like really rabid fans. Okay, I grew up in St. Louis. My younger brother is probably the most rabid St. Louis Cardinals fan you will ever meet in your entire life. Um, but it's a community. He's, he's with a group of buddies. They, they go to the games. He's the same way with the Blues. Um, you know, the Bulls, the Bears, the Blackhawks. I mean, those are a little on the crazy end of the spectrum. Um, but, um, so why is community important? Because, see, 
Every one of us in this room longs for community. You just probably didn't realize it. Because we're created for community. So, if you look at, at the very beginning in Genesis, it talks about in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the Spirit of God covered, hovered over the face of the waters. In John chapter 1 where it talks about in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God talks about all things were created by him and for him. So all three persons of the Godhead are there at the very beginning. Um, God says in Genesis, before he makes man, he says, let us make man in our image, plural. So you've got this perfect community of the Godhead. One God, three persons, perfect community, perfect fellowship for all of, all of eternity. We're created in the image of God. With that, among a myriad of other things, comes this longing for community. We're created for community. Um, God creates Adam. He says it's not good for man to be alone. He creates Eve. And what does God do? He comes down in the cool of the day and he walks in the garden with Adam and Eve and they fellowship. There's community. Small, but it's community. Community is broken. What was the first thing that happened after Adam and Eve disobeyed? They hid themselves. God comes down looking for them. Adam, where are you? And I was <laughs> hiding in the bushes because I was naked and I was a little embarrassed. Um, community is broken. Not only did they lose community between them and God, but they lost it with each other because God says, well, who told you you're naked? Did you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And like any self-respecting man, Adam says, well, Eve gave it to me and I ate. Well, yeah, way to throw her under the bus, pal. And what does Eve do? Well, she blames the snake. But now, now there's division between husband and wife, man and woman. And so even that most basic component of community has been shattered by sin. And so ever since, we have been trying to find our way back to community. Um, community is not just a, a Christian idea. You know, we've already talked about Fellowship of the Rings, sports. Um, there are a lot of groups that are geared towards specific hobbies or interests, um, probably the biggest example of the world's idea of community is your local bar. In fact, in the 1980s, um, there was a really popular TV show called Cheers. And the whole idea of Cheers was, don't you want to go where everybody knows your name? So listening to, I was going to play the opening credits, but it was, it was long and it was really boring because it's just credits scrolling and there was really nothing much to watch. But this is the, the opening of the theme song of Cheers. Make your, making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? And then jump to the chorus. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name, and they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. That show, I mean, it seems the like 1980s, okay, it was, was the world even in color back then? That was incredibly popular. Um, I think because it was based around the camaraderie and the community of the regulars that, uh, that came to Cheers. So, so let's turn, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in the Bible to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to talk about what does God say about community. We're going to start in, chapter, or in verse 23. Um, the the statement from Sailorville Values uses just verses 24 and 25, but I want to read 23, and hopefully you'll understand why. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. So we're called to hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. And in a world where values are constantly shifting, 
but where Christian standards are constant, that's a challenge. So why hope and not faith? It seems like it would make more sense. Hold on to your profession of faith, right? Because Hebrews is, is all about Christ. In the beginning, is Christ is better. Christ is a better king. He's a better prophet. He's a better priest. He's a better sacrifice. The writer of Hebrews has just got done talking about how Christ is better than the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. Um, and then he comes to and he says, hold on to your confession of hope. So hope is more comprehensive. It includes specific promises about the future. And in fact, in the next chapter, it's going to go through what we call the hall of faith. And it talks about faith is the essence of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So hope, our faith rather, is a, is a more broad umbrella. Hope is a more specific thing. Um, so while Hebrews looks forward and speaks of glories that outshine the glories of this life, the writer was aware that some of his readers were in danger of relaxing their hold on this hope. We also might be in danger of losing this hope. And I think in light of, of the announcement earlier, I think that's a, a real thing. There are so many people that are looking to belong somewhere looking for friendship, looking for hope, looking for community, and they don't have it. Um, hold on to our profession of hope. Similar to James 1, where we're told when we ask for wisdom, we must ask in faith without any doubting, which really means without hedging your bets. You know, I'm going to ask God for wisdom, but I'm also going to, you know, try this. Um, in a similar way, when we're told to hold fast um, our hope, our hope is, faith, is based on the faithfulness of the one who promised, um, who is God. Sin deceives us into placing our hope into other things, into questioning whether God is enough or whether he's trustworthy. So we need community to hold fast to our profession of hope because we need each other. Um, to hang on to our hope. In Hebrews chapter 3, so a couple chapters earlier in verses 12 and 13, it says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And then in Colossians 3.16, you may be familiar with this, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So what, what does it mean to admonish? So how, how many of you have ever been admonished? Okay, again, mo most of the leaders. Um, all of us actually have been admonished. So to admonish somebody is to express warning or disapproval, especially in a gentle, earnest or solicitous manner. So it's not a tongue lashing, it's not a lecture, it's not a brow beating. It's more like, you know, your grandma and your grandpa just kind of giving you a gentle word of, hey, don't do that. Um, to give friendly, earnest advice or encouragement. That is what Christian community does for each other. So when we gather on Wednesday night, when we break into small groups, this is what we're supposed to be accomplishing. Because we are a community here. We have a lot of differences. We have a lot of similarities. But all of you are in high school. Most of you profess to know the Lord. Not all of you. Um, but we're all here for a common purpose. So that makes us a community. Not just the guys or the girls in your small group the group as a whole, not just the, the popular ones or the ones that are talented and are up front, not just the outgoing ones, but the shy ones that you don't really even notice that just kind of slip in and slip out. We're all community, and so we need to, to admonish each other. We need to gently encourage 
um, each other to hold fast to our profession of hope. Sometimes that's just talking about what is your profession of hope. Um, but we'll get into that a more, more a little bit later. So followers of Jesus um, never walk alone. That's my second point. Um, verse 24, consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Consider, uh, it indicates there's, there's some thought required. It doesn't just kind of come natural or it doesn't just happen. Um, something more of an individual effort is needed. So we need to be alert to the needs of others around us in our community. So when we come to youth group, you know, we're naturally drawn to those that we know or that we know well or things are those that are similar to us. Um, let me admonish you. Consider one another. Look for the, the students who are new, who are visiting, who are just by themselves. Um, for this to truly be a Christ-honoring community, for it to fulfill Sailorville's goal of more people, more like Jesus, we need to be looking out for each other. Um, Galatians 6, 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. This verse emphasizes the responsibility of believers to help and support each other in times of difficulty, reflecting the idea of a caring and interconnected community. Um, so not only are we supposed to then just be aware of those around us and the needs around us, because, you know, even in my own small group on Wednesday nights, there are some heavy things that we talk about and, and pray about. There's some, like, potentially life-altering things going on that you probably would, would never really notice. Um, so beyond that, it says, encouraging one another to love and good works. Now, how many of you like to stir the pot? You get with your friends. Yeah. Some, some are pointing to others. Some are just smiling. Um, it's fun. It's fun to rile people up. It's fun to kind of, you know get them worked up a little bit. Um, so that's kind of, that's the idea here. Only, in, you know, a, a more godly way. So, so instead of stirring the pot to get somebody all flustered and, and riled up, what if we stirred the pot to get us to love each other and to do good works? Because just like James says, faith without works is dead, love needs good works it, it's that's how it's expressed you know if you really love somebody but you never tell them i mean hallmark is full of of movies about the person that sit there pining away but they're too shy and they're too scared and 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 the love of their life is over there that has no clue that they exist and then by the end of the hour which is really a half an hour with commercials you know they've miraculously found each other and, and now they're soulmates for life um, love needs good works to go along with it. It needs to be intentional. Love must have a practical outcome. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 20, 12 to 27, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it talks about the church in the metaphor of, as the body. So God has gifted us each differently. Some are the finger and some are the toes and some are the elbows and the ears and nose. And, you know, but some are the biceps and the pecs and the, you know, all the cool things that, um, you know, we hit the gym to, to work out. Um, God has given us each different gifts and abilities. Why? Is it so we can be really cool and, and feel great about ourselves? No, it's to use them for the benefit of the body. They're to be exercised in love for the benefit of others. Um, this passage underscores the importance of unity and mutual support in the Christian community. So we need to understand that our faith grows and it transforms as we walk together in community, stirring each other up, inciting each other to love and good works. It has the idea of building on each other, feeding off each other, so to speak. It's a continual thing. We keep on stirring each other up. We keep on loving. We keep on doing good works. 
And as we do, our capacity for love grows. Our ability and desire to do good work grows. And in the process, our grasp and our hold on our profession of hope grows. Community makes us better, as point number three. Meeting regularly as a community of believers is not optional. Verse 25 says, Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. The word to forsake means to leave in the lurch. And if you've ever depended on somebody and they left you in the lurch, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, that's not a that's not a good feeling. Excuse me. Here in the United States, we have a we're very individualistic and we're proud of it. We're the rugged pioneer. We're out by ourselves on the ranch and we're pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. You know, we're tough and we like it. Um, nobody's gonna tell me what to do. Well, that translates into our walk with Christ and our relationship with each other. We're very individualistic, and we're proud of it. Um, That's an anomaly. The church over the course and span of history has not operated that way. Um, Others depend on us, and so... We can't let them down. The phrase assembling ourselves together presumably is talking about worship meetings, but I think it's somewhat ambiguous so that it can include other types of gathering. Um, It does, though, seem to imply some type of official gathering. Um, Gathering together provides mutual support and encouragement. Close and regular fellowship with other believers is not just an idea, but it's an absolute necessity for the encouragement of Christian values. The New Testament never encourages the idea of the lone Christian. In 1 Peter chapter 5, the elders are commanded to lead and shepherd the flock. The younger believers are commanded to submit to their elders, and we're all commanded to submit to one another in humility. Um, so... Oh, never mind. I lost my trade of thought there. We'll move on. Um, but in chapter 5, so we're still in First Peter, chapter 5, verse 8, we're warned, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. This is probably one of the most important reasons why we should gather together instead of by ourselves. I've got a little video clip that I'd like to show you that I think really visually illustrates what this verse is saying. <clears throat> so you got this water buffalo. It's not looking too good for him, is it? This is a lone Christian at home watching church online. Okay, it's really not, but you know. So it's not looking good for him, is it? I mean, he's about to fall down here. And then look, here comes the cavalry. And then we see it in slow motion. Here we go. And then he zooms out, and guess what? Here's the rest of the community. Isn't that cool? I think that says in a much more interesting way and more eloquent than I ever could. But that is exactly why we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. There are heavy things out there. Satan is intentionally walking around looking for the straggler off to the side or looking for the straggler surrounded in the midst of everybody but who is kind of isolating themselves, looking for somebody to devour where are the rest of the water buffaloes, baby? Coming in, horns lowered, making the lions run. Um, so, the need for community becomes even more important as Christ's return draws near. And we're with this, we're almost done. Um, the phrase, the and so much more as you see the day approaching. The phrase, the day 
in the Old Testament is always referencing the idea of the day of the Lord, um, a day of reckoning, a day of judgment. Zephaniah 1, 14 through 18 describes the day of the Lord as bitter, a day of wrath, of trouble, of distress, a day when God judges the wicked. In the New Testament, the day of the Lord is often connected with the return of Christ. 2 Peter 3 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? So there's that idea, as you see the day approaching all the more. This was written close to 2,000 years ago. There was a real panic for a while in the early church. They thought that Christ had returned and they missed it. Um, which sounds a little silly to us because, you know, here we are 2,000 years later, still waiting for the return of Christ, still thinking is imminent. Um, the, the actual timeline is irrelevant. The idea is, as Christians, we should live as if the dawning of the day was so near that its arrival was just beyond the horizon. Um, so we need to hold fast to our profession of hope. We need to help each other with that. And one of the ways we do that is we don't forsake the assembling together of ourselves. Another way is that we stir one another up to love and good deeds. Um, so, why choose to do life together as part of community? What does it mean to be part of God's family? Because you can't truly be part of Christian community and enjoy biblical fellowship unless you're part of God's family. So what do you need to do to be part of God's family? Well, first, you need to acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you're separated from a perfect and holy God and you're deserving His wrath. You're deserving his judgment in the day of the Lord. That's a hard thing to acknowledge. Even as an adult walking with Christ for a number of years, to look into my own heart and so on and say, but for Christ, I would just be a, a wretched sinner. Um, so you need to acknowledge you're a sinner. You must believe that God came down. He became man in the person of Jesus. He lived the perfect life that you could never live. You must believe that Jesus died on your behalf paying the penalty for your sins and that he rose from the dead, breaking the power of sin and death. And then finally, you must believe that his sacrifice on your behalf is enough. You can't do anything to earn it. Um, you need to trust only in him for eternal life. So when you hear somebody say that they've been saved, what have they been saved from? They've been saved from the wrath of God. They've been saved from God himself. Um, so, if you are not part of God's family, if through the course of our, I'll say conversation, even though I did most of the talking, if you've, if you've recognized through the course of, of this evening that you're not part of God's family, come talk to me. Come talk to Andrew. Come talk to your leader. We would love nothing more than to help you understand how you can become part of God's family and truly become part of community. Because you can't be a part of community unless you're in God's family. And you need to be in community in order to hold fast to your profession of hope. So, With that, let's pray. And uh, then we'll go. There are some really in-depth, thought-provoking, gripping questions that I wrote. So if you don't like them, feel free to ask other questions. Uh, Father, thank you for tonight. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for community. I thank you for this group of people here, like-minded brothers and sisters in Christ, in varying um, places in our walk with you, or not yet having begun a walk with you, and so not yet a brother and sister in Christ. Lord, well, I thank you for the encouragement from your word. I thank you for the truth. And I ask, Lord, that you would help us to put into practice the things that we've uh, read and discussed, 
And help us, Lord, to really be a true community that honors you, one that encourages each of us to greater love and good deeds, one that looks out for one another, that bears the burdens of one another, and um, one that helps us to hold firm and grasp tightly our profession of hope. Thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.